can everyone tell me if they can hear me, if they can see me in the chat? But I'll just continue so long. So good evening to everyone in the room and welcome finally to the APSIP UCT opening event. I'm Chanel Koza and I'm the Entrepreneurship Director at APSIP UCT. And I guess my job today is just to take us through the program as seamlessly as possible. Um, it's definitely a pity that we're not able to connect in person due to unfortunate circumstances. But I really do hope that all of us can get as much value out of this experience as possible. So just to start off, um, I'll give the rules of engagement, so to speak. So please make sure that your mic is off when you're not speaking. And when you are speaking, please switch off your video. But as soon as you're done speaking, please switch it off. And can we just ask everyone in the background, please not be potentially distracting to anyone in the room. And just on the Q&A and the dialogue session that will follow later on, um, please ask your questions in the chat during Mr. Maseko's keynote address. And then my team and I will collect the questions, six or seven questions, and we'll give them to Mr. Maseko to answer during the dialogue session. And yeah, so with that being said, I'd like to hand over to CISO, who will be introducing the rest of the Absolute UCT team, as well as addressing us as the UCT chairperson. Um, thank you, Sano. I'd like to say hi to everyone. Okay, I think I'm visible. So I'd like to ex extend a greeting to Mr. Sipo Masego, keynote speaker for today's event, for taking time out of his must-be busy schedule considering the times that we're in. I greet our new absent national president, Polo Letegara Debe, who has been tasked with steering our organization in the right direction and who we as the absent student chapters offer our full support. A sincere salutation to our new national executive committee members who are also present with us today and are tasked with assisting our president in the running of this organization. I send greetings to the ABSIP Western Cape Provincial Executive Committee who have also played a big role in helping this event come into fruition and have consulted with us since the beginning of the year on getting our chapter up and running. I'd like to particularly mention Pomolo Rabana who has assisted our team step by step and has been a guiding hand throughout the year. The presence of ABSIP national structures being the young professionals and student chapters is noted, and we would like to extend a particular greeting to Tabiso and Prudence, who are members of the National Executive Committee and Young Professionals, who will be assisting the student chapters for the remainder of the year. I'd like to acknowledge Tapio Elias, who has assisted us with regards to logistics and other tasks related to today's events. Thank you, Tapio. I would like to greet and acknowledge, and, and acknowledge members of my Executive Committee, whom I, for, I will formally introduce later, for all the hard work since, since we've been carrying out since November last year. And I'm excited for what we have planned together for the year for our members, despite the challenges that we face at present. Lastly, I'd like to welcome all members and other affiliated individuals to our events, and we hope that you will leave enriched after today's affairs. I'm moving forward before I get to my address. I would just like to formally introduce my team. So I would like to share slide with you all. Uh, it should be appearing just about now. So we just firstly would like to congratulate the new APSIP Executive Committee who was selected at the recent AGM, which happened a couple of weeks back, with our new president being Polo Letegara Tebe our Deputy President being Langa Matonga, Secretary General being Kelly de Kock, Kaya Stole was appointed as the Treasurer General, Prudence Makololo is the Deputy Treasurer General, and Tabi Sorashefola was our new Deputy Secretary General. Introducing the UCT APSEP team, uh, Sisoletsu Kutelezi is the chairperson for this year. 
Uh, I am my vice chairperson is Moezi Londa. Mona Lisa Johnson is our treasurer. Pila Mabele is our secretary general for the year. Hopi Chikovi is our AWIF director for the year. Lee Koza and our host for tonight is our entrepreneurship director. Shamiso Mujakachi, who's head of our finance portfolio, which we've rebranded for the trading portfolio this year. And lastly, Lebohang Malindi, our events and marketing director. This is the team that has helped put everything together and who I'll be working with side by side for the remainder of the year. I would like to just show a few highlights from our opening of our orientation week, uh, where we just have a few photos just running through everybody. And just some, just some crucial things to show some of the stuff that we've been able to do this year in terms of recruiting members. We managed to sign over 300 members to join into our society this year. So I think it was quite a successful recruitment drive that we carried out at the beginning of the year. The address. 2020 has been a year plagued with multiple uncertainties and a constant unraveling of a wide spectrum of social injustices and economic challenges. COVID-19, racial tensions, and gender-based violence being the trigger words of what South Africa is facing at present. As an organization which aims to promote excellent inclusivity of previously marginalized groups in corporate South Africa, we are not immune to these factors which threaten to hold back the change needed at present. This change can be encapsulated in one word that often causes uproar in many South African boardrooms and industries. That word is transformation. Many believe this word simply refers to a change in the demographics of a company and its leadership structures. However, that is limiting the true essence of the word in this context. Transformation refers to a change in thought process and ideology that requires one to be more aware of the situation around them at present, including societal ills and other forms of social imbal imbalances ranging from gender, class to race. It is supposed to illustrate that an all-inclusive framework that provides a larger benefit to society as a whole, and in the long run, provides a more sustainable model for our success in the economy. Such change is not possible if one's gender, social class, or race is seen as an anchor when one attempts to climb the corporate ladder. Therefore, it is through the hard work of organizations such as APSIP and others like it to take charge in what, in what is meant to be a collective responsibility and help society steer in the right direction. It is important as absent members that we take accountability and responsibility for that that lays ahead of us. Despite 25 years of existence as an organization, we might be facing a greater task than those that have come before us. Having, yes, having read an alarming headline yesterday that said, South African business confidence hits a record low, I was shocked. I believe this illustrates the magnitude of the difficulty that lies ahead. This coupled with the radical change in the way we engage in business with the arrival of the fourth industrial revolution, which has already been here for some time, could mark the end for many businesses and change the way in which, in which many industries operate. However, tonight's keynote address should make you aware of these changes that will occur and what is required as we head towards the digitalization of South African business. As we aim to encourage a new generation of thought leadership, Tonight's event should be the spark that engineers a new caliber of youth that ensures collective responsibility, collaboration, innovation, and most importantly, transformation. Therefore, it is essential that we lead the way as our nation delves into an uncertain future. Thank you. Thank you, Caesar, for your address. Um, so, I'd like to invite Mr. Maseko to take the stage, pardon me, I'd actually like to invite the national president to take the stage, um, if you could please take the stage.
Good evening, colleagues. Um, welcome to everyone who made it uh, to this event uh, this evening. I know that uh, we all have lots of pressures with family and other matters, so it's, it's, it's great to see uh, such a good response uh, to this uh, event. I am Polo Letika, the newly appointed a president of, of, of APSIP, uh, I think, uh, um, is it CISO, who uh, just introduced the APSIP uh, um, NEC that came into being literally two weeks ago uh, to the day. So we're uh, fairly new uh, to this, uh, uh, the, to the positions that we've just assumed and, and uh, we're quite excited about the future. Dede Masego, I'd like to thank you uh, also for honoring us with your presence. Uh, you know, you wear another hat as my boss, so I'm also very aware that I have to be on my best behavior today. But thank you so much for making the time to spend uh, with a very important uh, constituent uh, of, of APSIP being the, the student uh, chapter, which of course uh, are our uh, future leaders uh, as well. And we really do look forward uh, to, to your, um, your, your, your presentation uh, this evening. Um, because we are, we've been in, in office for only two weeks, I thought I would use this time um, not to spend it too much introducing the NEC team because I think the student chapter members actually know them fairly well. But perhaps to share with you, um, you know, the, the journey of APSIP for those who may not have a full appreciation of it, uh, where it is today and where this leadership uh, team hopes uh, to take it uh, together, of course, with uh, the support of everybody um, on this call, uh, and of course, we'll be looking at Ndete Masekwa's uh, door as well to, to see how he supports uh, our efforts in this regard. So if you will allow me about 10 minutes to do that so that we can move on to the most important part of this evening. Can you see my screen? Is my screen visible? Yes, press. <laughs> okay, great. Yes. So it's this limited. is the team uh, that was already uh, introduced, so I will not spend time on that. Um, but I think uh, it's important for me to share with you, you know, when, when APSIP was started in 1995, which is uh, 25 years ago, um, at the time, there were hardly any black professionals in the financial services sector. If, if, if there were uh, professionals, they were typically your, you know, your, your retail uh, bank clerks and, and similar, but uh, not occupying any uh, positions of significance uh, when it comes to investment banking, asset management, you know, uh, the pension fund industry and, and other related uh, sectors within financial services. Uh, and I think looking back, it's safe to say that whenever I walk into a, you know, a room where APSIP has an event or any financial services uh, body has an event and see the number of uh, faces, black faces, women, occupying significant positions uh, within the various entities uh, that we have in, in our sector. It's pleasing to say that I think APSIP has um, really, to a large extent, driven uh, you know, the transformation um, you know, objective very strongly. And we, we are starting to see the change in the racial profiling, at least from a professional uh, perspective, in a professional member's perspective. We've also seen a significant increase, of course, in the number of black-owned financial services firms. Uh, uh, whilst we are not where we need to be, but certainly, um, you know, it, it, it has changed quite significantly from what it was in 1995. And I think those are, you know, those those are wins we must uh, absolutely celebrate. Um, you will know, uh, most of you, that APSIP was also quite instrumental in uh, driving what we now call the financial services uh, code which uh, was first uh, gazetted, I will say, or, or rather it wasn't gazetted at the time, it was rather publicized in 2003, where you know, we're moving at the time from targets for black women being 4% at a management level, and uh, APSIP uh, together with other uh, constituencies on the, on the Charter Council pushed for women uh, to actually uh, um, you know, have a 50% representation in management. So, so there are significant wins we have, um, you know, we have we've begged uh, along the way over the years, uh, and we are hoping that by changing the racial makeup and profile of the financial services sector, it will ultimately uh, result in uh, and trickle in, in, in 
transformation in other sectors because I think we all know that a lot of uh, people with financial services background, as, you know, from a training perspective as well as academic background perspective, tend to find their way into other sectors of the economy. Most uh, uh, CFOs would, of course, have come out of our sector, including the accounting sector, of course. So, so although we start off uh, being financial services professionals, we actually end up playing very uh, uh, significant roles and executive roles in other sectors of the economy. So whilst the focus has been on financial services, in fact, the impact was meant always to, 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 to be across uh, you know, all the sectors of, of, of our economy. So, so I think we, we, we need to continually be driving this transformation uh, uh, objective to ensure that we actually spread our tentacles beyond uh, this sector, and not only in terms of uh, representation of, of people in positions of power, but I think importantly in the types of products and services that we, uh, we, we develop uh, in response to the needs of, of, of our economy. Um, we cannot continue to have a situation where financial products in their various forms continue to uh, meet the, the needs and requirements of the elite, as it were, uh, forgetting that we, for, for, you know, for, for, for all intents and purposes, remain a developing economy. So we're hoping that as we transform the sector, we also transform the types of products and services that we take out to market so that we can really address the underserved uh, people uh, of, of our country. Um, but I think having reflected on, on some of the successes we've gained over the years, I think many people are very much alive to the fact that the upset of today has lost the stature it once held uh, in the eyes of many. Uh, we came in two weeks ago to find uh, an organization that really um, had, has a lot of gaps. We, so those who would have attended the, the AGM would have um, you know, um, experienced the difficulty we had in discussing things like audited financial statements. Uh, there were issues of governance that we are trying to, to now grapple with. Um, you know, issues of having a prop, proper capacity in the national office so that we can support the initiatives of all our uh, chapters, including the, the student chapter. Uh, and this new team really decided that there were, we were going to focus on just, you know, first things first, getting the basics uh, right before we go out and start making a lot of noise about a lot of things and really reflecting on what should, APSIP, what should the APSIP of today and the future be, considering that the, the APSIP of 1995 uh, has by and large achieved what it tried to achieve at the time. So what is it that is relevant uh, to the APSIP of today and uh, tomorrow? And we came up with a 100-day plan. Uh, so you will be pleased to know that we've been blessed with a very committed uh, executive uh, team that has spent the past two weeks working flat out to really try and ensure that we fix, you know, the things that need to be fixed very, very quickly, so that we we, we set a platform and a foundation that will enable us to really rise and 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 you know move forward towards achieving some of the more important uh, objectives that are facing us, or rather uh, address the, the more important challenges that are facing us uh, today. So in our hundred day plan, uh, you know, we we have prioritized. Uh, you know, finalizing the outstanding audit issues from our 2017 audited financial statements, because that is, that, that, that's how far back we go in terms of audited financial statements, which is not a good reflection uh, on an organization such as ours. And we've already started uh, the work on uh, the 2018 audit, and uh, according to our plans, uh, we should be done with this process by the end of June. We are addressing the issue of our tax uh, position and our tax status so that we are able to re regain our PBO status, which is important when we do a fundraising with corporates because uh, they need to be able to claim that as part of their Section 18A uh, deductions that are allowed in the Income Tax Act. And really to strengthen the, the compliance culture within the organization. And I think importantly, and this is work that Kelly, who I think most of you know, uh, who is our Secretary General, has been spending a lot of time on looking at our constitutional documents, looking at what revisions need to be uh, put in place, ensuring that as an industry body, we also have a code of conduct uh, so that an absent member has to pass a particular test in order for them to, to, to meet the requirements uh, and the standards that are, that are expected of financial services professionals, which has not been 
uh, the case uh, at the moment. And of course, looking how we optimize our structures, including uh, the, 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 you know, the, the student chapter and, and the, the, the young professionals chapter and our and, and various other chapters, so that we make sure that we have a, a lean uh, machine that can actually execute and uh, deliver on, on the mandate. Uh, of course, we, we, we've, we've realized the importance of having a proper institution you know, uh, in place. We have to date not had a CEO, and we've had very um, limited resources at national office. As you will know, you, you mentioned Tapiwa in your opening address, but we've got Tapiwa and Queen uh, in the in national office, both of whom are administrators. And I think if we are serious about uh, playing the role and occupying the space that we think we need to be occupying in, in our economy, we actually need to have a proper uh, um, office uh, and properly capacitated office. So we've already started working on this uh, and we'll be uh, going out to market to recruit for these uh, um, uh, um, you know, roles uh, in, in, the, in the foreseeable future, but within the 90 day, sorry, the 100 day period. Uh, and of course, we have not tried to reinvent the wheel colleagues. Uh, there are very many uh, similar associations uh, that, that that, that uh, do um, some of the work that we're trying to do, of course, in, 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 in very specific sectors. And we've reached out to them and they've also been very uh, generous in helping us to think things around how do we set ourselves up, uh, even sharing some of their policies with us. So, so, we, so, so we're very excited that there's a lot of goodwill in the market uh, and there's a lot of support that has been extended to us. We've already started our stakeholder uh, a mapping process to understand who you know, to, to firstly to, 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 to group our stakeholders appropriately and understand what kind of interaction we need to be having uh, with our uh, stakeholders. And we've already started uh, actually engaging with some of our key stakeholders and we are getting again, very good, um, you know, very good feedback. People are very appreciative that we've been very proactive in the two weeks that we've been in office to engage them and understand how can UPSIP uh, serve them better. And we're starting to better understand what it is that the needs of our uh, members uh, are both corporate as well as um, as well as professional uh, members. Uh, importantly, you know, we we are here to serve our members, uh, and and we believe that we need to do that with the utmost professionalism. Uh, so you will see from next week that there will be much regular uh, communication. There will be more uh, sessions where. We are, you know, we're having a webinar again next week, which uh, I believe that Tabiso and Prudence will be issuing uh, the details thereof tonight. Uh, so we will be doing a lot of these things where, you know, we were trying to make sure that our members get benefit and value from uh, their association with us, where there will be training opportunities, where you'll have more opportunities to meet with uh, people like Data Maseko, who's uh, here with us uh, tonight, but more and more of those people, so that we can give you guys exposure and have an opportunity for you to engage and understand, you know, what opportunities are there and what are leaders of, of our country thinking about and potentially how can we form part of that process in terms of coming up with solutions to the challenges that we are facing as a, as a country. Um, and of course, um, I mentioned the fact that the stature of APSIP is not what it used to be. So we're very determined to ensure that we regain the credibility and the stature that we used to uh, occupy, especially on issues around advocacy. Uh, in the past, whatever you know, economic policy uh, paper that was issued by government would not uh, you know, uh, be approved until APSIP had uh, given commentary on it or given input uh, uh, into it. And we want to get back to, to a point where uh, our policymakers know that we are a key constituency, we're a key stakeholder that they need to engage with before they finalize any kind of policy so that we are able to really drive all these policies and all these decisions that government are making to ensure that we continue to drive the transformation uh, agenda in everything uh, that, that we do. And I think because we, we, we found that accountability was a real challenge uh, in, in, the, in the recent past for, for APSIP, we have committed, uh, and I continue to commit, make this commitment again in this meeting today, that within our first 100 days in office, so today will be, we're left with 90 days, we have to hold another a, a meeting with our membership where we are going to report back. So there will be a proper report back on what I've just shared with you now, so that you know, we can be interrogated and be asked questions around, you know, have you achieved what you needed to achieve? You know, are we... Are we are we, you know, meeting the mandates and and uh, and and ticking the boxes that 
uh, our membership uh, expects us to, to, to tick. But importantly, having understood the lay of the land in 100 days, we'll be in a much better position as well to share with you how we think we can take the upset forward and we will welcome all the input at that time uh, from yourselves where you tell us where you think, you know, well, you, you know, you might be going wrong here or we like this idea or maybe think about it this way. So well, we want to remain very engaged with our membership, but I think importantly, we want to be accountable to you uh, as our members so that we, we ensure that we remain relevant uh, to, to, to our membership. So, so those are the, the, the things that we are currently working on. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not too much. Uh, it, it, it seems like a lot, but it's actually not too much if you do it uh, in a clever way. And I think we found ways of leveraging off what other people have done well so that we do not reinvent uh, the wheel. Um, and I think for now, the way we see APSIP's value proposition, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, is that we want to strengthen our advocacy role because this is a role we've played very, very well in the past, and we want to make sure that we get back to the center of that. Um, in fact, there will be papers. I know that uh, Kaya, uh, who's our treasurer, and Langa, who's our deputy president, are already working on two papers this week with the view of releasing them uh, next week. And, and of course, we will want uh, input from our members as well, which we will then uh, table with uh, national government, just so that we ensure that we, we go back to our basics, we go back to our roots, which is an advocacy uh, organization. But we also believe that our role should also start moving from just being advocates and stone throwers, as it were, to actually supporting the transformation efforts uh, by, you know, by, by our, our members, particularly our corporate members, uh, where we are now looking at um, using a digital a technology, a digital technology platform to actually start curating our database, because the only asset we have as an association, as you can imagine, is our uh, membership uh, database. So we're, we're thinking creatively around how we curate this uh, database so that we can facilitate access to the talent pool that we, we have within our database. Uh, and of course, hopefully, uh, uh, you know, find opportunities for students to, you know, whether there are opportunities to do internships, maybe at Telcom or at any other financial services company that is our corporate member and various other things that we can do with this database using digital technology. And I'm very glad that we are talking about digital technology today because I think you are all uh, you all either know or you are coming to the realization that technology is going to disrupt everything that we do, and the financial services sector uh, is one of the sectors that will be most impacted uh, by this digital transformation that is taking place. So hopefully, this talk today will help you guys to already start looking at how you reskill yourselves and you ready yourselves for this uh, digital uh, revolution. Uh, ensure that you become part of the disruption and you do not become disrupted and therefore uh, uh, you know uh, moved out of the mainstream so hopefully that you you'll get that benefit from this and we are looking also at um, um, having uh, executive roundtable uh, engagements between your senior executives uh, with uh, the, the younger uh, professionals within organizations we've already canvassed this some of the big corporate guys and they're very excited about that because you know, what we do not appreciate, and maybe people will also share this with us, is that people in, in high positions sometimes are quite lonely. They actually don't know what's going on uh, on the ground. They're not at the call phase. So they, 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 they really appreciate the opportunity to engage with the young minds uh, that are, you know, thinking about things differently, that are innovating, and that really understand what solutions will work and what, what will not work. And similarly, we want to also bring younger people to closer to to leadership for you guys to also have an appreciation of what it takes uh, to, to, to walk the path and the journey of moving from, I suppose, a, a young professional to ultimately becoming a leader in your own right in whatever sector that you operate in. Um, and of course, uh, we are really focused on ensuring that our event strategy has to be, it shouldn't be about, we are known for very glamorous gala dinners. In fact, that's the first thing that everybody has been has said to me oh gosh, we hope you're not going to be doing all those gala dinners. They, people want to have events that uh, are meaningful, that will lead uh, to, to people's uh, personal growth and development. And I think today, absolutely, certainly one of those. And, and we want to, to do more of these. And, and these are the four areas, uh, colleagues, that we think, at least in the interim, we need to be focusing on and really deepening and broadening so that when we then add on to this, at least we have a very strong foundation 
from where uh, we are uh, moving. So I will finish here because this is not my night. This is the uh, uh, was night, uh, but I thought it would be good uh, since I'm addressing you for the first time to also share with you what this new uh, team is thinking about. And you are more than welcome to reach out to us, to the office, and give us any thoughts that you may have in this regard. Thank you very much for listening to me. And Dr. Masoko, again, welcome. And we are looking forward to your address this evening. Yes, thank you so much, President. Um, thank you so much for this 100-day plan. It will be very exciting <coughs> to see the fruition of this. And we will, as members, try our best to take every opportunity. Um, without further ado, I'm here to introduce Mr. Sipo Masego. Mr. Sipo Masego was appointed as Group Chief Executive Officer and as an Executive Director of Telcom on the 1st of April, 2013. He's also the Chairman of the Board at BCX. Prior to this, he was the Group Chief Operating Officer and Managing Director at Vodacom, which he joined from BP Southern Africa where he held various roles from 1997, including Chief Operating Officer and Chief Executive Officer. Mr. Sipo Masego previously served as Chairman of the Board of SAPREF, a joint venture between Shell SA and BPSA. He has also been a non-executive director on the BMW SA Board until 2020. Mr. Sipo Masego is currently a non-executive director of the Board of the Center for Development and Enterprise, CDE. He uh, he also has a Bachelor of Arts as well as an LLB degree, and today we are very privileged to hear him speak about the accelerated shift to digitalization and how businesses in the telecommunications industry are adapting. Without further ado, Mr. Sipo Masego. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shamiso, and thanks uh, to CISO as well. And uh, thanks to yourself, Bolo, for welcoming me to address the student chapter of APSIP at UCT. Um, I had initially hoped that we will do this uh, physically, uh, which was the previous arrangement. And um, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, be able to attend, and neither could they, because COVID uh, changed all of that. And once COVID changed all of that, um, we had to resort to finding an alternative date, number one. Number two, um, making sure that we can try to do it in a virtual way. So thanks for inviting me. And um, I think as, as you indicated, Polo, to be invited by young people is actually quite, quite unnerving, all right? Uh, because they, you know, much, they're much younger, so that always counts for something. Um, they are clearly at university and they are still uh, informing themselves about things that probably uh, I've never heard of. So hopefully today what I'll share with you um, is my perspective. It, it surely is, may not be the, the most correct perspective. Um, and I do hope that in your own reflections, both as an organization, which is the student chapter, and also as individuals, uh, you'll find it very, very helpful. So, so I'll start today probably in a different way. Um, and, and, I, and I do hope my slides are, are, are showing. Um, so I'll start today with, with uh, I'm just trying to move my slides. So just pardon me, the slides, I'm not able to, I'm, I does say I'm sharing, so give me one minute, one minute. Uh, let's do that. And then I'll try to share them again. So can you see them now? Yes, you can. Thank you. Yeah, for some reason when I move them, uh, I'm not able to do that. Let me try again. 
It also does show that I also have a lot to learn about technology and digital, right? <laughs> perhaps, perhaps try presentation mode, if you can. Yeah, I did On that. PowerPoint. Yeah, let's try that. I'll try a different deck altogether. Let's see if that works. Is it better now? Yes. Great. So let's get all reset. So what I, what I thought I'll do in, in the presentation to share with you is probably not to start today, but actually go a couple of years back um, in, in terms of some of the students and young people who probably were like yourselves, who find themselves in a different, in a different uh, situation, um, and therefore who needed to uh, do what they had to do. So as a start, I mean, I wanted us to first and foremost pay tribute to the 1976 generation. All right. And the 1976 generation uh, was a courageous bunch of young people uh, who sacrificed and who played a key role um, in the journey to the for the liberation of black people. And I'm sure you'd have seen some of those pictures, and I'll tell you a bit of a story about it. I think this picture on the extreme left is probably one of the most uh, known uh, victim, if not the first victim uh, of the day, Hector Peterson. I think he was about 13 years old um, and um, he had just been shot and he subsequently died. To the right of those pictures at the top, um, it's three people who were quite instrumental um, in the 1976 uprising. Um, to the extreme left of that picture, uh, is Tsietsi Mashinini, who was the leader of the SSRC, uh, who sadly passed away in 1990. Uh, the middle of that is a gentleman called Selvi Semela, uh, who actually passed away only in 2018. Um, and uh, to the right of that picture is uh, Bani Mukhatle, who luckily is still alive. He lives in Alexander. Um, and they were probably broadly your age at that time. I think Selby was the youngest in 76. He was probably about 18 years old. Uh, Tsietsi and, uh, and Barney were probably about 20 years, 21 years old. And that picture that you see, uh, they, had, yeah, they had been hunted for a long time in the country. And uh, they emerged there having escaped the country and landing at Gatwick Airport in London. Um, and that's them there. And below that, uh, it's obviously Tsietsi Mashinini in the background. In front of him, Khotso Siakrolo, uh, who was his deputy. Um, and uh, sadly, Khotso passed away in 2004. Yeah, so, so, so that generation, um, it's, it's, a, it's a generation that I really believe we should pay tribute to them. And I think it's quite fortuitous that you having your event on the 11th of June, on Youth Month, and uh, June 16 is next week, Tuesday. And, and I think it's very, very important that as you commence your journey, you reflect on what other young people in the past have had to contend with uh, and have had to deal with. Um, and, um, and there's a quotation by an anonymous student on the left, um, about how our parents are prepared to suffer under the white man's rule. They've been living uh, for years under these laws and they've become immune to them, but we strongly refuse to swallow an education that is made, designed to make us slaves in the country of our birth. Um, and they took a stand. So I think it's appropriate that we, we pay tribute to them at this time. And more importantly, you as young people as well, you recognize those that came before you. 
And I think Pulu as well spoke about the formation of, of APSIP, and uh, which I really, really appreciated is how she honored those that came before the current uh, executive team. And, and when you reflect on, yeah, what is it that they had to deal with in 76 and, and what you'd call their, their ecosystem? Um, it was a, 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 a very racist apartheid regime. All organizations had been banned. There were no electoral rights. Uh, everything was racially segregated. The education system was immensely inferior. There was an attempt to push Africans as a medium of instruction. Uh, there were huge disparities uh, in terms of resourcing. Um, and at the time, most black people were effectively instructed for low and semi-skilled jobs. So that was their reality um, as young people. What was the economy like? <clears throat> All levers of economic power were owned by just the white minority. There were absolutely zero economic opportunities for, for, for black people. Um, highly concentrated economy, which you may probably want to call the roots of white monopoly capital. Um, there was the beginning of economic sanctions against the country that were coming into effect. Um, and as, as employees, mostly blue collar workers, domestic jobs, uh, there were no labor rights at the time. There were massive uh, salary disparities, even if you were qualified. There was job reservation, um, better pay and better working conditions, even for uneducated poor white people. Um, and, and, and that was the prevailing ecosystem at the time. Um, and, I, and I'll share these slides with yourself, CISO, um, if there's any interest. And what did they stand for? Because they stood for something. And I say this because I think it's also very, very important as you find yourself at this time um, in 2020 to also be clear as the student chapter of APSIP at UCT, to be clear what you, what you stand for um, and what it is that you want to be able to achieve. Uh, so, so they stood first and foremost for, for solidarity. Um, they were absolutely committed to anti-racism, um, very committed to access to quality education, um, and obviously the elimination of apartheid. And I, think, and, and I think that's their reality and that's what they stood for. Um, and to be between 17 years and probably about 24 years, 25 years, um, to stand for those things, and some of them having had to sacrifice quite a lot, um, um, is something very, very instructive. They could have chosen to be, to be vain. Uh, they could have chosen uh, not to care, but they, they made a particular choice, um, which I think, um, as I come to at least interpret our context today, uh, we'll see how you can start to leverage digital uh, in a way that hopefully enables you also to stand for something bigger than you. And, and as we all know, what did they achieve? What are the long lasting effects of the 1976 uprising? All right. So uh, the transformation of our education system, it may not be where we want it to be, um, but you know, Africans as a medium of instruction at schools were successfully abolished. Uh, they inspired millions of future youth generations uh, to take actions against, against injustice, not just in South Africa, uh, but across the world. Um, the mobilization and the, and the spirit of solidarity um, and actually brought the right level of international attention uh, to some of the issues that uh, were taking place in this country. Um, in fact, actually, it's one of, it's in remembrance of everything that happened at that time that today we have a public holiday on June 16, uh, precisely because of, of what they had to do. And this picture is quite instructive for me because I guess if you, yeah, if you just took pictures at a different point in time, one is in 76 and one is in 2015, the pictures are not too dissimilar, right? 
2015, probably around the height of fees must fall. Maybe some of you at university already, some of you may not have been, um, but it begins to shape a, a view of the kind of dynamics uh, that the generation of the 20 hundreds um, is beginning or has to deal with and has to, and has to confront. And in my view, I think it's a, yeah, it's a trifecta of uh, challenges. Uh, the first one is just youth unemployment. Uh, it's, it's quite pronounced. Um, every one of us probably knows a relative or a friend uh, who is young, who is not employed and uh, is looking for gainful employment. Uh, lack of economic growth and poverty um, and the quality of education that is very, very asymmetrical. Um, and I think those are challenges that in a sense you could say are different, but at the same time very similar uh, to what uh, the, the generation of 76 uh, found themselves having, having to deal with. And they're different in the sense that, um, yeah, the, the, the current generation live and work and play in a digital world. And in a sense, without probably being aware, they're also leading the digital shift, right? Um, and um, I've probably picked on three important factors which actually indicate the digital life uh, of young people, consciously or unconsciously. Uh, smart, smartphone penetration is one of the highest amongst, amongst young people. Um, so, 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 so that says something. Uh, data usage is relatively high. Uh, they use it for, for, for a whole lot of activities. Um, and they, 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 they tend to spend quite a lot of money on, on, mobile, on mobile services. And in a sense, the digital savings statistics indicate that young people are driving the digital shift, probably, unfortunately, mostly on the consumption side. Uh, rather than on the production side, um, and I think that um, I think that um, the 21st century has, in a sense, created an evolution that uh, is characterized by quite a number of uh, digital digital activities. Right, um, uh, social media is very very predominant. Um, speed uh, is very very crucial. Omnichannel. Um, and, um, and an experience uh, that, is, that is very, very uh, seamless. And I suppose with the understanding of today's context, uh, young people have the opportunity to lead and to create homegrown uh, technology, if I may kind of put it that way, homegrown technology solutions to solve key structural challenges. What are we seeing today? Um, and thanks to COVID, uh, many students, and I, and I figured out as I was looking at uh, many of you, mostly are at home, uh, schools and universities are broadly closed, uh, students are having to study from home. Uh, that's what we see today. Um, the face-to-face the, the -face -to -face learning uh, has driven up IT costs on top of salaries and, and fixed assets. Um, and the quality of education is not accessed in a, in a symmetrical way. So that's what we see today. And you could almost say, actually, what is the opportunity that lies in there, actually? Um, which is, is there a way in which we can create online education platforms that can attract both top quality and top quartile um, uh, yeah students and, and lecturers and all of those sorts of people uh, to be able to drive a different way of access um, into educational opportunities. Uh, secondly, um, is there a way in which we can start to think about artificial intelligence and language translation services so that we can also remove language as a barrier to premium learning? Um, and how can we then be able to leverage uh, on technologies like virtual reality and augmented reality to create virtual, rich virtual experiences 
uh, that in the classroom that can enhance uh, our knowledge uh, systems. Uh, I think similar opportunities exist in the financial sector. Uh, you guys are largely in that world. Uh, and I was quite pleased uh, when, when uh, Polo was talking about, uh, you know, there needs to be imagination about new business models that can be created in leveraging technology. So what are we seeing, for instance, in, in the financial sector? Branches are closing. I spoke to one, bank of a, one CEO of a bank uh, today uh, who was telling me how they are responding to COVID. They have a lot less branches open. They have a lot less people uh, in the branches. Um, customer behaviors are changing. Um, so there is a bias now and a preference to what you'd call contactless banking. Um, yet at the same time, we have at least 23% uh, of South Africans unbanked. Most certainly most of those black and most certainly most of them uh, at the low end uh, of, the, of, the, of the economic ladder. Um, and how do we then start to think about, about opportunities? Um, how do we start thinking about creating digital online banking platforms uh, that can be able to solve? some of the challenges that you are seeing in terms of uh, retail uh, branches being closed. Um, how do we improve and increase on data transparency uh, so that you can reduce the intermediation uh, that is there, which drives up cost and complexity? Um, and how can, we, how can we leverage mobile devices to increase penetration and create financial inclusion? And I think this goes to not just the transactional banking services, uh, but how do we start <clears throat> reimagining savings? Um, how do we start thinking about things like micro, micro savings, micro insurance, micro investments, uh, so that the financial inclusion is not just around what people buy, but also it's how they begin to build some form of financial security that is affordable, that is accessible, and build capital uh, for, for themselves uh, for the future. So, so, so through the lens of COVID-19, um, you know, my view is that the financial services sector is really challenged. And the, and the, and the recovery will be dependent on how it adopts technology and digital transformation. Um, and I mean, what are the, what are the areas of challenge? Um, you know, this crisis has forced a lot of firms to, to have to digitize at speed. Um, banks are overwhelmed, for instance, with uh, credit requests. Uh, investment firms are, scramble to, are scrambling to reassure investors. Uh, insurance companies are hoping to avoid huge payouts. Um, and their business models are being challenged at the same time. So if you have a car and you've been under lockdown for the last two months and your car has been in the garage, actually, should you be paying vehicle insurance? Uh, should you be paying maybe the premium that you are currently paying? So how do you then start to innovate around potentially behaviors and lifestyles that are changing, um, that begins to give consumers, as mostly black consumers, especially at the bottom end of the pyramid, access to some of these products and solutions, um, which in the past, the product design and the, and the product playbook was designed, if I may put it, for the elite. And, and once you have the triggers through COVID-19, um, you then get into a recession, which we are technically in, and you have a domino effect that rips through the financial services market. Um, banks are bracing themselves for, deep, for, for, for a recession. Uh, there's quite a lot of uh, mergers and acquisitions activities, including in investment firms. Uh, the insurance companies um, are, big, are also getting to be under pressure. Um, and therefore, COVID-19 begins to be a catalyst, if you, if, you, if you will. It forces us to go down a route that we may have been skeptical um, to, to explore. 
Um, and I think it's a catalyst in, in financial services without, without a doubt um, in terms of, in terms of um, yeah, just driving a truly digital financial services, reshape, reshaping potentially the structure of the industry. Um, and, and, and our view is that digital partnerships will start to proliferate, uh, marketplaces will start growing uh, share uh, of distribution, um, uh, artificial intelligence use will start to increase, um, that in itself has cultural biases because some of the language translation uh, AI services are largely very Eurocentric uh, or very Northern Hemisphere centric. Um, uh, you know, platforms like Siri and so forth, and how do we start thinking about these in our own context? Uh, fewer people will be needed in some roles. Smaller and leaner organizations will, will emerge. Um, and, and I think the sector that you are in will not be spared uh, of, of, these, of these changes. Um, and, and whilst you look at that, the, the, yeah, the, the, the changes in the economy and in the social structure uh, will also further potentially hinder young people's ability um, yeah, to yeah, young people's ability to benefit from the, from the opportunities of the, of the digital economy, right? Um, we still have income inequalities. Uh, we have massive wage inequality in South Africa. Um, we have economic power imbalances. Um, we obviously still, still have huge unemployment and the digital divide is massive. And the digital divide is not just about data. Um, which is very, very important, and the cost of data, but it's also access to, to devices. It's also access to services and content. Um, all of that makes up what you'd call the ecosystem. And how do we make sure that, uh, looking at uh, the slide before this, and also how young people may be specifically impacted, how, do we th what, how then that begins to impact the transition uh, to, to the digital economy. I, th I think other challenges will emerge uh, for, for young people in the digital age. Uh, you know, reimagining the work of the future, the, the fourth industrial revolution labor impact. You know, I think some white collar jobs, a lot of people think that robot, robots will replace uh, a lot of what one may call uh, low skilled jobs. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think the, yeah, the gentleman who works in a garden, actually, I think that guy will survive uh, because robots do not want quite a lot of movement in what they do. Um, um, I think that guy will survive. I think that fellow will, will still be able to have a job, but, but I think some of the white collar jobs will disappear clerical jobs, uh, accounting jobs. I'll tell you what we've done in our company. So we introduced some robot, uh, you know, some, some RPAs, uh, so robotic process automation in some of our activities. And a journal that used to take an accountant, say, four hours uh, to do, uh, it takes a robot about four minutes. So that begins to then transform how we think about that part uh, of, of the world. Many jobs will change. Uh, financial institutions will probably employ coders. Um, software companies will probably em em uh, employ uh, accountants. Uh, new jobs will emerge. Uh, data scientists and, and artificial intelligence scientists. Um, so, so therefore, the, the workforce will probably need to be adaptive. So speed of innovation Technology disruption requires that a workforce that that learns and relearns continuously, um, and and the economy will be more and more data driv driven. Everything will be connected, and and just sort of imagine that uh, your phone or your laptop um, or your television will not just be the only thing that will be connected. Your fridge will be connected. Uh, your car will be connected. Um, um, and, and, and all of these, will, all of these instruments will be talking to one another. Um, 
and that will come with other risks of cyber security and identity theft. So in a sense, you could almost say that, you know, uh, data is the new oil. Um, um, and how do we then begin to transition to prepare, to prepare ourselves for that? And I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I think that, you know, the next wave of innovation and entrepreneurship should focus on solving socioeconomic issues with the end in mind. So how do we use technology to solve, amongst other things, our own problems? So innovation through social entrepreneurship, uh, digital technology training and access, um, how do we allow things like, you know, enabling uh, entrepreneurs to access pilot sites um, in provincial governments to solve some key service delivery issues, um, how do we enable very, very equity-based, grant-based funding instead of loans. So there's, there's going to have to be a whole rethinking of how do we fund social entrepreneurship? Because we can't run away from the fact that we still have quite a lot of social issues and we will not solve them the way we tried to solve them 30, 40 years ago. We need to find a different way uh, in which we solve those issues. Um, the competitiveness of uh, local industries, um, you know, agriculture begins to provide a massive opportunity um, in terms of how can we leverage technology there. Uh, we work with uh, some of our customers in the agricultural space. Um, you know, if the farmer previously had to drive around his or her farm in a, in a bucky to check if the fence is still strong, now they use drain te a, a drone technology. Um, now they're able to get the moisture conditions of the soil a lot more frequently so that they can be able to predict their harvest. Um, how do we strengthen other local industries? How do we strengthen township industries? How do we strengthen small and medium industries uh, in terms of technology adoption? Um, how can we provide training to all local entrepreneurs and local uh, small and medium businesses just on the basics of technology? Um, how do they use it, uh, use technology to provide them with enhanced business skills um, and, and be able to support local MS SMEs with, with agile funding uh, that enables them to, to succeed. Um, but, but having strengthened those local industries, how do we then connect them? So how do we connect local supply chains? Um, one of the reasons, yeah, one of the reasons, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult, especially in townships, to get, to get money circulating is because everybody extracts the money out of, out of the township. Um, and we need to find a way in which um, the company that I work for, if we need to have a contractor in, in Soweto, we don't bring a contractor from Weinberg or from Senton to go there who then gets paid and actually is not likely to spend the money back there. So how do we begin to strengthen local businesses in those areas so that the cash circulates um, within those communities? Um, how do we connect local entrepreneurs to corporate value chains? through aggregation platforms and marketplace platforms, uh, and obviously ensuring uh, efficient logistics. So I'll leave you with a quotation as to where to from here. And, and it's very, very simple uh, in my view. And I think it's a quotation simply from Steve. Uh, Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So it's a quotation from Steve Biko and um, probably said at a different time. And I think it applies probably to yourselves as well. Yeah. As a black person, as a black man, uh, you should be more independent. Uh, a black man should be more independent uh, and more and depend on himself for his freedom and not to take it for granted that someone else would lead him to it. 
Um, and I think as the student chapter of UPSIP in Cape Town, it's very, very important working with your national leadership that you should become more in independent and depend on yourselves for your own freedom, uh, economic freedom, uh, career freedom, and not, to and not take it for granted that somebody else will do it for you. Um, because you'll essentially be the kind of person who he was trying to describe, standing at the touchline to witness a game that they should be playing. Um, when in fact, actually, what they should be doing is do things for themselves and all by themselves. Um, and I think that as you begin to really grasp some of the changes that technology will potentially build, will bring about, it's important that your own solidarity as the chapter at UCT, but also with other chapters and other professionals as an organization becomes even more important because it's only through that that uh, you'll be able to collaborate, create things, solve your problems, uh, irrespective of class, irrespective of where you come from, and begin to build new ecosystems. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to lose. Uh, uh, digital can become the great equalizer, but it's very, very important to realize that even as we bring it into our lives and into our economy and into our thinking, um, it has to be inclusive. Um, as young people who are at university, you must not leave behind those that are still at high school. And you must find a way in which you make their lives better uh, so that you can be able to create a broader ecosystem uh, and mitigate the negative impact and accentuate the positive uh, opportunity. So I'll sort of stop there uh, to CISO and, and Sam, um, and hopefully it's helpful in terms of just how I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it, um, and um, the context between where you are and the generations before yourself. And thank you for taking the time to, to listen to me. I hope it was helpful. It was probably uh, one of the most uh, anxious presentations I had to make. Uh, I had a risk committee meeting with our board earlier on. I promise you that was very, very easy uh, than having to prepare for this one. So thank you. I will stop there. Thank you very much, Mr. Maseko, for your address. Um, and just to ease some of your concerns, I'd just like to tell you what I took from the presentation. So firstly, I think it was especially relevant considering the happenings in our country and our global community. The story of the use of 76 very much put some needed perspective in our lives as emerging adults and students in these current times. And thank you for offering a shift in perspective that we should rather view COVID-19 as a catalyst for some much needed change in how we aim to create value in business and in our lives. And thank you for making us cognizant of the challenges that might hinder our ability as the youth to benefit from this emerging digital community. You also emphasize the importance of the youth and in driving innovation and coming up with solutions to challenges that we face and that it's important for us to learn and keep learning. And it also just did a lot to show us how far we've come as a country and that there's still so much to be grateful for. So thank you very much for that. Um, so I think we can get into our dialogue session now. Uh, so just a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions, please send them in the chat room. And I'll just start with the, the questions that I have at hand right now. So I'll just ask one question and then I'll allow you to answer and I'll ask the next after you're done. So the first question is, what is the capacity of the South African telecoms industry to, telecoms industry to service this increased demand for digital, digitalization? Um, so if you'd like some clarity on the question, please ask me as well, and I'll do that. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, I think actually to be fair in South Africa, we have a fairly, fairly vibrant telecom sector. Uh, it's a market that has about four players. Uh, there is massive capex that is invested in the, in, the, in the sector every year. I think between the four main players, um, ourselves, and, and our three other competitors, roughly we probably invest about 20, 25 billion rands every year in capex to enhance capacity. Um, clearly the growth of data uh, in the in the last couple of years has been phenomenal. But what we've seen th since COVID started, so since around middle of March, actually is that traffic has probably grown by 50%. Um, and um, clearly a lot more still needs to happen in terms of infrastructure, uh, in terms of skills, uh, but more importantly as well, in terms of services that can be provided on top of the networks. Uh, Data in itself, I mean, you know, all of you are young people and you probably are on social media, etc. That, that's great. But actually, we should find a way in which we can use bandwidth as well for, for other services, you know, for learning, for work, um, um, all of the kind of things that we're doing. And I suppose that we need to be able to start having South African grown solutions, you know. So now we are on a a platform called Zoom. And I think at some point it would be great if uh, some of you um, can be part of a platform that is very, very local, uh, localized so that we are not just consumers uh, of, of technology, but we can also be suppliers thereof as well. So, so, so I think the, 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 the telco sector is kind of well-placed. I mean, can it do more? I think so. Uh, but I think so far, none of us have uh, tripped over uh, given some of the challenges that we have seen. All right. Thank you. And the second question is, how do we ensure data access to lower, so to lower living standards members of the community so they're able to participate in the digital community, digital economy? So that's a, that's an unfair question on me, actually. All right, that's a very, very unfair question on me. Um, uh, in terms of the 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 cost of data, I think I think I think that um, the way I would approach it is that we absolutely have to improve access. That's the first thing. We absolutely have to improve access, uh, and through that, it means data must be accessible and affordable. I think that's very, very important. But at the same time, devices need to be accessible and affordable um, because without smart devices, people are not able to do what they need to do. And if the cost of the device um, is astronomically high, uh, that is not sustainable. Um, and I also believe that uh, probably data should be zero rated for what we would call social good activities, all right? And probably you guys will quarrel with me. So actually, I don't think that data should be zero rated for Facebook and for Instagram and, and Twitter, but it should be zero rated for all educational um, websites and, and platforms. I think it should be zero rated for health platforms, for what I would call social good. Uh, because I think through that, you are able to really enhance access. Uh, but when it's not used for social good, you know, when somebody takes a picture of their food and shares it with somebody else, you know, I'm not sure whether there's a social good in that. Um, so, so there needs to be a way, because it's a subsidy. And we need to be very smart around how we use the subsidy so that we can use it to fund those that need to use it in a way that will give us the multiplier effect in the economy uh, going forward. Um, I, think, I think there's attempts as well to introduce free Wi-Fi, especially in public places, uh, public libraries, um, um, uh, hospitals, all of those kind of areas. So really beginning to make sure that uh, it, is, it is as pervasive as, as possible. But you also need to balance the notion of free relative to the investment that you need to have. 
uh, one of the reasons, I mean, if you look at the trajectory of the US and the, and the European Union, uh, the European Union, in a sense, lags the US in terms of um, high-speed broadband. Um, and, and I think it's important that as you put in social obligations uh, on telecommunications providers, you then don't do it in a way that discourages investment. Um, because you want the 25 billion to keep rolling every year to increase capacity uh, to, to, yeah, to, to, to make sure that it's accessible, uh, the download speeds must get better, and all of that means that the capacity needs to be uh, as much as you, uh, you possibly can, 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 can get it to. Yeah, I think there's another question uh, about, do I think that the country would benefit um, were, th were there to be further competition in the, in the telecommunications industry? Yeah, I mean, I think co competition is good, right? Competition is very, very good. I think that competition, in a sense, makes you better. Uh, competition, in a sense, enables you to, challenges you to innovate, to invest in a different way, um so I, I yeah i think i think i think competition would be good um, um but at the same time you just need to make sure that it's it's fair competition so it's fair competition it's a level playing field uh, so that the best person can win based on where they start uh, if the competition then is not fair you will end up with with an economy that is very, very highly concentrated. South Africa actually, if you look at it, has high levels of, of concentration in the economy. We roughly have about 58 million people and uh, we probably have about four bakeries in this country, all right? So, so four bakeries for 58 million people. Um, in other parts of the world, you know, almost every neighborhood has a bakery. And in South Africa, between Albany and Sasko and two, three other guys, they deliver bread everywhere. So, so, so high levels of concentration. I think even in the banking side, high levels of concentration uh, on the retail side. So, and, and that is why small and medium businesses are not able to emerge because the big players have a lot of capital and part of what you need to be able to do is to break up uh, the monopolies so that more and more businesses can be able to, to compete. Um, and I think that's a big opportunity there. Yeah, what do I think uh, the South African telecom industry will play in the Africa trade agreement? Um, will there be an increase in the sharing of intellectual property amongst African countries? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, the, I mean, the first area of cooperation is just around standards, uh, making sure that uh, when we adopt 4G, as an example, we can adopt it, all of us, on the same frequency, which means that, and the reason why when you place a call and you are in Johannesburg and you're calling somebody in, in Lagos or in Nairobi and that person can pick up the phone and hear you is because there was the initial cooperation that we use the same frequency for a particular service. So, 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 so I, think, I think cooperation is, is very, very good. Um, I think the continent needs to cooperate more. I think we need to trade with each other a lot more. Um, I think that there needs to be the movement of goods and people uh, on the continent needs to be encouraged um, and needs to be enhanced um, so that we can be able to build local large enterprises that can also go out into the world and, and compete. Um, and, um, you know, and I'm not sure much about intellectual property sharing, uh, but I think I would probably call it more best practice sharing uh, between ourselves and the rest of the continent. So I, I really believe there is a, there's a big opportunity there. Right, I see another question. Um, if I can just put it up. So, have you 
The question states, have you noticed an increase in mental health related issues with your employees due to COVID-19? And how has that impacted Telcom, especially considering that mental health issues have become the leading burden in the world economy, partly due to lost productivity? Yeah, I mean, we, we're very concerned about that. I mean, we're really, really concerned about um, the, yeah, the stresses and the anxiety that is created through COVID-19. Uh, at a number of levels. Firstly, just at a personal health level, uh, will I be okay and so forth? Will my family be okay? I think that's one dimension of it. Uh, but also anxiety then that begins to creep in about, will I have a job? What does that mean? Um, what we have done is to make available uh, services uh, on an anonymous basis for staff to be able to access uh, mental health uh, support. Uh, from our service providers uh, who then are able to provide professional expertise on how uh, those members of staff can be able to cope. It's a new world for everybody, right? It's a really it's a new world for everybody. I mean, I can't even say I'm, I'm coping myself. You're working in a different environment. You don't interact with the people that you, you work with as you used to in the past. Um, you may not have the right working space at home. Some other people may not be as fortunate to have a spare room where they can be able to work and it's quiet. So, so quite a lot of new uh, issues emerge and I think we are trying to improve on the service uh, that we can be able uh, to provide uh, to, 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 our, to our staff. So, um, so, so that would be my answer around that. Um, yeah, there's a question around the majority of the countries poor and economically marginalized are black and live in spatially disadvantaged areas, townships and rural areas. The, the architecture of the economy and the spatial makeup of the country already makes it difficult for some in these pockets of society to access technology uh, as, as well as reliable internet con connectivity. What then does the yeah, fourth industrial revolution then mean? Um, um, for those people. Yeah, and it's a, it's a very, very valid question, all right? So one of the things that we've started to do as a company is to actually roll out fiber in, in the townships um, and finding a way in which we can make it very, very accessible, uh, bringing price points down as well. Um, you, know, and I, you know, I'm not sure whether it's the right price point or not. I mean, I think a couple of uh, weeks ago, the guys launched price points of you know, something in the order of about 300 bucks or so per month, unlimited and uncapped data uh, for, for, for fiber. And I think on the copper side, yeah, 200 bucks unlimited and uncapped data. Uh, so, so we try. Um, and, and I think that um, there is absolutely an imperative that we put as much capital into those areas as we do in Rosebank and Sentin and all of those sorts of places. So absolutely an imperative. And it's something which we as an organization are, are committing ourselves to. And we're looking at ways in which we can make it work, but not just to invest there. And let's find a way in which we can impact the, the ecosystem a bit more. So let's use the contractors in those areas. And can we encourage them to employ people from that area so that you can begin to create a bit of a a bit of an ecosystem. So un unless we do that, you're absolutely correct. It makes a mockery of the so-called fourth industrial revolution. It will, it will, it will accentuate the digital divide. Uh, if you look at 50 years from now, um, it will still be a country or a continent that has essentially two worlds. Those that are, are the lost generation and those that have made uh, have made it an ordinary they'll be in the in the in the minority. All right, Mr. Maseko, I've been told that we've run out of time. So thank you for offering your time and your insights and your knowledge. It's very much appreciated. And yeah, so this is me officially closing off the dialogue Thank session. Much. And thanks to all of you for taking the time to listen to me. I really appreciate it. No problem. Uh, Mr. Maseko, before we
con officially conclude with the dialogue session. I think, firstly, I'd like to thank you for addressing us today. I know that it is quite difficult to work around your busy schedule. But I think there's one pressing question that I had after reading an article yesterday. I was made aware that the federal government post the 2008 financial crisis in the United States sort of tried to launch a program, like a loan program to sort of boost investment into, into technology. It was an initiative started by the Department of Energy where Tesla borrowed a sum of money to sort of accelerate, um, to accelerate their processes and sort, of, and sort of grow. And they managed to pay back this loan within 10 years. And I know with South Africa, they've tried similar initiatives with the land bank to sort of boost agriculture and to sort of get output and people involved in the economy. Do you think something like this would be successful if government was to try to do this towards businesses that focus towards digitalization um, in South Africa? Yeah, so geez, a uh, tough question, Cizo. I mean, really tough question. I think, I think it would actually, and I think it's not just a, it's not just a government task, right? I think that um, private sector itself needs to begin to set aside uh, investment funds in terms of accelerating um, technology investments. Um, and I think we need to identify entities that can help us uh, to identify the right opportunity so that those opportunities can be invested in um, in the form of startups. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm proud and privileged to work with your national chairperson, uh, Bulu, who uh, heads up uh, a company called IDF. And um, we have a fund with them and we put, you know, a bit of money in there where we've asked them to, and given them the mandate to invest in technology companies. And some of the, some of the things that I've seen that they do in health, in in education, in entertainment, in a lot of areas where, you know, as we meet those entrepreneurs and we, as we meet those startups, uh, all of them ostensibly black, uh, very, very young, uh, almost 40, 50% black female, uh, I was super impressed. Um, so if it is possible that we can do it, that we can do it at that scale, you can imagine when we have an ability to pool quite a lot of resources. Um, and have some kind of matching model where for every 100 million that we put down, government can put 100 million. And before you know, uh, you will have a massive fund uh, that we can be able to uh, advance to, yeah, to those that uh, have startups, that have great ideas, that may not have access to capital, and uh, hopefully there will be a breakthrough there. So it's something that I support, but it just can't be government-led, I think. Uh, it also has to be supported by 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 private by private enterprise. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, our vice chairperson Wesley will be giving the closing address and the vote of thanks. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is um, Wesley. And I'm the vice chairperson of APSA BCT. Um, I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say that um, the address that we just received tonight um, has been very insightful um, and very helpful in giving us an inside view of the impact that COVID-19 has had on the corporate industry, just as well as um, having a more overall view of our history and where we come from. And we thank Mr. Masipo Maseko for that. And I think it has been especially impactful since um, we've gotten this insight from someone who has been in the industry for many years and achieved a large sum of um, success during his corporate career. Um, without having said much more, Mr. Sipo Maiseko, um, as the chairperson of APSA BCT, speaking on behalf of the APSA BCT student chapter, would like to thank you for availing yourself, um, take the time out of your schedule to come and address us. Um, we know that during these uncertain times, um, your schedule might be very busy and um, there's a lot of um, unorthodox events that are going on, so we really appreciate it. And, um, I'm 100% sure that all the attendees um, that were able to attend, all our student members and absent members are in 100% um, better off position in terms of knowledge about um, where not only we come from as, as, as black individuals, but where we're going in terms of the shifts uh, in industry and in digitalization. Um, we have a gift for you just to show this appreciation that we'll 
be sent over to you um, and we will communicate, to, uh, communicate with, uh, that with you in due time. Um, furthermore, I would also like to thank our National Apps of Executive Community, uh, Executive Community um, giving a, a special mention to our president who was able to address us earlier on. Um, we are very excited for the direction that the student chapters will take um, under this new leadership. Um, I would also like to take this time to thank APSIP Young Professionals and the Western Cape, APSIP Western Cape Executive Committee um, for working with us as a uh, UCT student chapter in terms of setting up this meeting and ensuring everything um, ran smoothly. And uh, last but not least, I would like to take this time to thank all of our APSIP members as well as all the students that took the time out of their schedules um, to come and join us today. Um, we're sure that, you know, um, some of you, you know, with, with the shift to online learning, you might have been busy, but we really appreciate that you came and um, equipped yourself with this knowledge that we've been given by Mr. Sipo Maseko. And uh, joining, which I think from the turnout we've got today, the student chapter of the year, um, which is absolute BCT. We thank all of you for, <laughs> for coming today and um, hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Right. Well, thank you very much and thanks for the gift and very thoughtful of you, I will, I will declare it, all right? So once I receive it, I'll make sure that I declare it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for to everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Uh, yes. Ciao. Bye, everyone. Okay, dim kill. Oh, what a success, guys! Yo, <laughs> lovely, lovely. We love that. Was great. It. Thanks, guys. No, thank you for joining, guys. Thank you for coming Bye. in. Thank you so much. Wait, any idea on when UCT is opening? Yeah. Um. Apparently in October, but looking at Cape Town, <laughs> I highly doubt that will be happening. <laughs> it was that jog. It was that jog that people took. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, a, that was pretty much a success, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, that was pretty good. You guys good. looked good. See, as I look. All professional and stuff. That's <laughs> our team. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. okay wait i've got a question yeah uh wait. are we putting the recording are we gonna have access to the recording yeah so i'm just gonna upload it now and send you the link on we transfer let's hope you get the video as well all right thank you so much and then sees where i'm not sure if you could request for the slides if, if you can share them maybe in a thank you email to everybody who participated and the gift can we get that to him so that we don't seem like yeah 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 no that would be, be done okay cool cool all right cool stuff all right, all right. everybody cheers all right. i'm ending the meeting cheers